Hey everybody, how's it going? I hope you're having a lovely Tuesday morning. Today I would like to discuss a decision that Chevy made that I think is going to have some long-term consequences for their company and electric vehicle adoption in general that they're not thinking about right now because they're thinking about the bottom line short term. This is that they are discontinuing support for the battery on the 2013 through the 2017 model Chevy Spark electric vehicle. This car is not a drag racing car. It's not a car that you're going to be seeing at construction sites or anything like that. It's a thirteen dollars to $20,000 vehicle when it came out that for the five years that it was produced that you're going to be using to get from point A to point B. If you have a short commute, you want to save money on gas and you want to save on maintenance because you're not going to have to have as many things maintained on it as you would on an internal combustion engine vehicle, which are more complex. That's what it was and they are not gonna be replacing batteries in this anymore. Something that's important to understand is that this car is barely five years old for many of the people that got it, and there's not gonna be any support for the battery. And that means that when the one item that is guaranteed to die inside of your car, no matter how nice you are to it, you have no options. You now have a paperweight, a 15 to $20,000 paperweight. And this is going to really affect people's opinions of electric vehicles, and I also think it is going to affect the adoption of these electric vehicles. People are going to look at this and go, why would I buy an electric car when a few years after I buy it, they can stop supporting it, and I'm not stuck with a paperweight. I don't want to buy something that's going to be junk in a couple of years. And honestly, if people came to that conclusion, I wouldn't blame them. We've criticized Tesla a lot on this channel for a number of different reasons, but one area where I will give Tesla credit is they will sell you a battery. You may not like the cost of the battery, you may not like the terms of the battery, but they will sell you a battery to a three-year-old car, five-year-old car, eight-year-old car, a 10-year-old car. Some people may be so mad that they will blow up their car when they see the cost of the battery, but they will get a battery. And again, we, we've criticized them for a number of different things. There was one case where somebody was driving down the road and their car got nicked by road debris. And as a result, there was some sort of coolant line or something or some coolant nozzle that was damaged on the battery. The cells of the battery are fine, but Tesla still said 16,000 bucks for a new battery. We're not going to fix just the nozzle. I think that this is a bad thing to do. I think this is the way that the Genius Bar handles repairs. And I don't think this is something that is going to be good for electric vehicle adoption. But at the end of the day, at the very least, Tesla was willing to sell you a battery, which is more than can be said for Chevy a major American automobile manufacturer. I could understand if this was some small startup that was going out of business in a year, or so. this is a small startup that didn't get a lot of sales, but we're talking about a major American automobile manufacturer that's been around for decades, saying a car that was sold five years ago has zero support right now. This is gonna cause a lot of people to second guess whether they wish to purchase an electric vehicle, because I don't know about you, but when I spend 15 or $20,000 on something, I would like it to last more than five years, and I wanna know that if something goes wrong with it, that I have the ability to go somewhere, whether the dealer or a third party, to have a repair done. Now, Gruber Motors has gone over this in detail. He went over the cost of Tesla battery packs to try and answer the question, is Tesla simply ripping people off when they're selling you replacement packs, or are they selling them close to cost? And the conclusion that he came to and that many agreed with is that Tesla is indeed selling these packs close to cost. You may not like it, but due to the price and cost of lithium and manufacturing, everything that goes into these particular batteries with this technology, they are expensive at this point in time. Now, again, we can, uh, we can agree that replacing the entire battery when all you need is to fix a nozzle is not the right thing to do. But when you're talking about cars that have genuinely destroyed and degraded batteries, the, the Tesla repla battery replacements with current technology are actually, is actually a decent price. But the the problem here is when you have companies that are major American automobile manufacturers with a reputation and a pedigree that are saying, we're just not going to support this at all. The message that's going to send is, well, gee, again, it's one thing, I'm not, I don't want to diss Aptera, but let's say Aptera comes out and four years later, they go out of business. It's not like it's some random new company. If a major automobile manufacturer comes out and says, we're just not supporting this after five years, then the question really just has to be asked, well, gee, is Toyota going to do that? Lexus going to do that? Is Audi going to do that? Is Mercedes going to do that? Is Tesla, you know, is everybody else going to eventually do that? I think that's going to cause people to have sincere doubt in electric vehicle adoption. And there are already enough things that are keeping people from adopting electric vehicles, whether we're talking about the expense of electric vehicles, whether we're talking about the repairability from, from companies like this, whether we're talking about Mercedes having a message in the vehicle that says, do not open the hood. 
I mean, they, you know, again, these are not things that are inherent to electric vehicles. They do not have to be less repairable. They do not have to be designed in the way the one wheel is, where you know, if you, if you unplug the battery from the BMS, it bricks the board. You do not have to have a, a device where the parts are not sold five years after they're created. These are specific decisions that these manufacturers are making that are not just, that it's not something that's inherent to electric vehicle technology, but they are inherent to those particular manufacturers. But what I am worried about are consumers that are then going to think, well, this is something with electric vehicles, because it wasn't like this with my internal combustion engine car, but this is what they're doing with electric vehicles. So electric vehicles must suck, so I'm not going to buy one. And as somebody who's kind of an electric vehicle fanboy, whether it's driving an electric car or just messing with the ped loop on my phase runner on my bike, I like them. I think they're cool. They're fun. They're exciting. I enjoy working on them. I enjoy maintaining them. And I do admittedly enjoy messing with the ped loop on my phase runner. It, it kind of makes me sad to see that this is what's being done because I know there's going to be a lot of people out there that look at this and go, F that, I'm never buying an electric vehicle. Now, one of the things from this article that surprised the crap out of me is somebody saying, and I quote, with used prices so high, my wife and I were thinking of selling our Spark to trade up to a new Bolt. The Bolt is another Chevy electric vehicle. Let me know if you think I'm crazy in the comments, but I would never do that, ever. If you make an electric vehicle in 2017, and I need a battery in 2022, and you say, LOL, we stopped making the battery, I'm never buying an electric vehicle from you again. Dare I say it, I may never buy any vehicle from you again because you've demonstrated that you're completely willing to create a fifteen dollars or $20,000 product five years ago and not support it merely five years down the line. This is not a smartphone. Again, with a smartphone, you may say it's wrong that they're not supported. You may agree that parts should be available longer. You may not agree with the lack of right to repair. But at the end of the day, I paid $300 for this thing. So if something goes wrong with it, listen, it sucks, but it's 300 bucks. When I pay $15,000 for something, I expect that parts are available five years down the line. I expect that even if the manufacturer can't fix it, that somebody else can fix it. And as Gruber Mobers run over over here when he's talking about the economies of scale and how much it costs to create these batteries and the lack of profit margin, you bet your ass nobody's going to be making an aftermarket battery for the Chevy Spark. And that's really sad because the people that actually decided to be early adopters of this particularly cool and efficient car are people that are going to be getting screwed if they are outside of their warranty period. They are not going to have a car that has degraded performance. They're going to have a car that is literally a paperweight when it no longer starts with no option to repair it whatsoever. And I have a feeling that they are going to tell every single one of their friends, coworkers, and family members how they got screwed purchasing that electric car and why they're never, ever, ever doing it again. And that is going to resonate. It's not only going to resonate within Chevy, but I think it's going to resonate across manufacturers to a point where if Toyota comes out with an electric vehicle, somebody that heard the story of their friend with the Chevy Spark that got screwed over on a 15K purchase is like, yeah, I'm not going to buy that either. So I think it's really important that electric vehicle manufacturers take this into account when making these types of decisions. I understand your desire to save money in the short term, and I understand why it is you do not want to produce a battery for something that had low sales volume. However, you should consider how this is going to affect your future sales volume when people see how you didn't support your old products and say, you know what, I'm not touching an electric vehicle for the next five or 10 years. I'm not doing it. I can't risk that. And I wouldn't blame them. Further, this is also something that is actually changing my own thoughts on right to repair and some of the thoughts behind what it should include. One of the things that I talked about on, uh, in this video that I did a year ago on Europe's push for right to repair was the concern about parts availability. I thought that forcing parts to be available for 10 years was going a little bit too far. One of the things I said in that video is that companies, whether it's Mobile Centrics or Asset Genie or ScreenCountry.com, they'll figure out which devices are going to be popular long term and they'll buy a lot of parts. Back when A1466 screens were $72, People like me bought like three to 600 of them. I saw this is a very popular device. People are gonna to wanna to fix this for a long period of time. And when I you know, made the investment to buy all those screens, I was able to fix that device into the future for a long period of time and make a decent profit doing it because I had bought in bulk. And we were able to actually offer, again, you know, years and years after this device was discontinued, we were still able to fix it for people. You know, forcing the manufacturer to make the part available for a really long time might increase their cost long term and might be something that actually allows them to argue against right to repair. However, when I see what's going on with something that has this high of a purchase price, it almost leads me towards changing my mind. Should right to repair require that parts are made available for a longer period of time than what they're currently made available? I thought 
people should just buy as many parts as they need if they're repair and parts companies in the very beginning because that's typically what tends to happen anyway. Again, you could go to Asset Genie and buy a screen to a computer that was discontinued in 2008 in 2016 or 2017 because they knew that there would be profitability in stocking those parts. That was already happening. But when we're talking about devices that don't just cost three or five hundred dollars anymore, or one thousand dollars like a laptop, but fifteen to twenty thousand dollars like a car, and the specific challenges there are such that third parties are not going to be stocking up on parts for them or producing them, is that something that should be allowed? Is that like should right to repair? Should this general concept be modified in some way, shape, or form, to where you do have to make parts available for a certain period of time? Yeah, when we're talking about a $300 device, man, when we're talking about a $15,000 device, like a car, yeah, I don't know. Let me know what you think in the comments down below. That's it for today. And as always, I hope you learned something. Me personally, I'm not giving Chevy money for an electric vehicle anytime soon because this lets me know that they are willing to just not support their customers only a few years after the purchase. Ugh, just no. Anyway. I'm going to stop rambling now. I would usually edit out the rambling, but I don't have my Da Vinci dongle, and I am... It, it, I know what's going to happen. I'm going to, like, I'm going to take out my credit card. I'm going to buy it, and literally like 10 seconds after I buy it, it's always in the corner over there, and I'm going to go... Grr! So I, I, I want to see if I can find it. I want to see if I find it before I get the replacement. Anyway, see you all in the next video. Bye now.